Good morning, everyone. So happy to be together this morning. Invite you to stand and worship with us.
are so worthy of our worship, Jesus. We're just amazed by you once again this morning. So we just invite you into our hearts. We ask you to um, transform us from the inside out. We give you our full attention. And we just want to take a step closer to you today, Jesus. So we give you all honor, all glory, all praise, King Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. <clears throat> See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Thanks, Emily. Good morning, everyone. All right, wake up. Let's go. My name's Joe. I get to be one of the pastors here at Pleasant Valley. So grateful for that opportunity that I've had for going on 17 years. And this morning, uh, you're going to probably wish maybe I wasn't here. This is such a hard passage of scripture to, to teach on. I mean, um, this is the, so we're in this series on a book of Revelation, just kind of catch you up quickly. And we're um, in the, just ending the first three chapters today. There's these seven letters written to these real live churches in the first century. And we're on the seventh one. The name of the city is called Laodicea. And Jesus has nothing good to say to them. And so Joe gets to talk to you about that. Um, it's a beautiful um, little letter, really, uh, because it is, I've entitled it, The Disgusting Church That Jesus Loved. Can anybody relate <laughs> in your own personal life? Um, this is so much a reality, and, and I'm so grateful that Jesus Christ is willing to tell the truth. Anybody with me? Someone loves me enough to come to my door and say, we got to talk. I need a word with you. <laughs> and so we're going to dive in uh, to this, uh, these few verses in Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22 that Emily just uh, read to you. I'd like to have another word of prayer before we do that. Lord, thank you uh, for your presence with us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that it's your grace and your truth that both changes us, but also gives us a model, a way forward in our own life to think about how to live in this world. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have his way in each one of our lives as we look at this text of Scripture. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I'm going to use the metaphor of a doctor. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because in one of the verses, about verse 19, um, Jesus says, I want you to come and buy from me salve for your eyes. Um, I have some medicinal help for you. And so I've also then outlined the text uh, by um, a diagnosis. I've um, also seen... Uh, symptoms in the passage, and then there's remedy, and then finally, a hopeful, or at least a proposed 
prognosis, okay? We, we kind of are wrestling all the time with Scripture with these two big ideas, aren't we? The sovereignty of God, the power of God, the authority of God, the predestination of God, and the will of a human being. Would you agree? And we want to settle that all the time, and the Lord never releases that tension. Would you agree? All right, and so we have the theological positions on both sides of this, and big old camps on one side of that, and big old camps on the other side, but the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit never relieves the tension. That God, yes, is in control, that he has a foreknowledge, that he has a predestination, that he knows all things probable, possible, yet... There's also this thing where he invites me to respond to him in obedience, to act on my will. Okay, and so we're there again. And so the disgusting church that Jesus loved. This is also the church, evidently, that Jesus never showed up to. Do you see verse 20, the most famous of all the verses in this text? See, I stand at the door and knock. I'm not inside. This is the church that Jesus never attended. Whoa. And verse 21 uh, and 22, it's, the, it's the, the church that never sat on the right throne. There's a throne that Jesus Christ invites his believers and his, and his church to sit on with him. <laughs> this church was sitting on the wrong throne. So all throughout this text, we have this conviction and so I have been frankly worn out and I could not wait to come and share some of this with you uh, this morning because it's hard. this text is hard on a human soul on purpose. It is to leave the human soul forlorn and, and in great despair of needing some hope greater than the despair that we feel greater than the disgust that we, uh, we do understand about ourselves, if we're half honest. Anybody? Yes. <laughs> we're disgusting before a holy God. Yet a holy God has loved us so much that he paid for our disgustingness. And we got to wrestle with that and that tension. I'm disgusting before God, but he loves me anyway. And this church had to wrestle with that as well. All right, are you with me? Here's, here we go. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, and the originator of God's creation. On purpose, Jesus uses, and John quotes directly from Jesus' words here, and he uses this whole idea of an article to get our attention. There is no other amen but this one, the amen. The one who says it, and it is so. The one who, whatever he says, drop the mic after what he says because there's nothing else to be said. The amen. I, the no. You can talk to me afterwards. Okay. The faithful and true witness, the the one and only faithful and true witness. There's no one above him. Every other word that would come does not stand against him. Are you with me? The originator of God's creation. No one but Jesus Christ stood over creation and, and spoke it into being with his father and evidently the Father was looking to the Son to talk about the details of that creation. Nothing came into being that did not come into being by what Jesus said, John chapter 1. The originator of God's creation. He's the one speaking to us. And the reason that this is going to become important is because what he's going to say is really, really, really hard to hear. Can you imagine being this church in the first century, and you can't wait. Everybody else is getting a letter. All seven churches, and here's, here's it's our turn. We're going to read, Jesus is going to come, and he's going to give us a letter. 
Can you, can you, right? And this is a church, evidently, according to the text, they're blind. And so, right. And so all that, they can, all that they can think about is whatever they have concluded apart from what Jesus Christ has said. They haven't been listening. Not only blind, they haven't been listening to what God's Word says. Right? Okay, it's all right. All right, here we go. It's hard to be a parent, isn't it? Mm. Okay, what word was I? You don't know? Okay, I don't either. <coughs> All right. Help me out. They weren't hearing or seeing. They weren't hearing. Thank you very much. I evidently wasn't hearing and seeing either, so I can totally relate with this. They were not able to see the situation that they were in. Could that be true of you and me? Could we be blind? Could we have concluded wrongly when we match it next to what Jesus sees in our life? Could that happen? Right? It could. And so we have a group of people here that, like us, can get blinded. I know your works. This is a common phrase in all seven of the letters. I know your works. I see right through you. This is really scary for a human being. Would you agree? I see every detail of the motives, Joe, in your life. I see what's behind the decisions that you make. I see the conclusions you come to. I see your works. So, so that, that phrase has that effect on me. Here's the other effect that this particular phrase has on me. I have been brought up, as, as you have, in a theological teaching that says that we are saved by grace, and that is true. Not anything that we do. We can't add to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Christ on the cross. We're saved by grace. Would you agree? Now, we also learn in Scripture that God is very interested in how we spend our life. Would you agree with that? And so when this text says... I see your works. I am also injecting in that in my own life because of my tendency and my theology of grace that I know your works must be as le at least as important, if not more, than I know your belief system. He highlights works. I know how you behave, Joe. And, and what, what good is faith, James says, if it does not produce these works? We're back to the tension. Uh, is it grace or is it works? Well, it's grace we're saved by, but God is intending for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because God's at work in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 13 and 14. Are you with me? <clears throat> but the text says, I know your works. It's not, hey, you belong to the right church that has the right statement of faith. It's I know your works, church family. I know your works, individuals in the church. It, it kind of hits me. Does it hit you? I know your works. What you do, Joe, matters. How you behave, your volition matters. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other. And this one is the one that theologians and commentators are like all over the board on how to interpret this thing. And I want to say with all humility, I think I have it figured out. <laughs> Never, no one ever... Right? Yeah, thank you. 80% what Chad said last week, I think, in his message. Like, 80%, yeah, I'm not sure which 80% is right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the words of Jesus in this text are, I wish that you were hot or cold. How in the world could Jesus Christ wish that someone was spiritually cold? Now, we get the hot, right? And this text 
is kind of, um, if you want to have kind of a, uh, an easy understanding of where, uh, where John, the writer, is going, he uses the word lukewarm in compare, and he con- contrasts that with the word earnest or zealous. And then he has this last, in, in verse 21, he has the word conquer. If you want to kind of have an idea of where he's going, he's going from this whole idea of lukewarm, which is the disease that we're going to talk about, the diagnosis. But he's going from lukewarm to zealousness to being a conqueror. And so in this particular text, because, so, so I, I wish you were neither cold nor hot. Here, here's my interpretation. You can take it or you can leave it, but I know pragmatically it's, it works for me. I get that Jesus Christ wants people that are zealous. The word zealous used in this text means to be hot or passionate about Jesus Christ. But what does cold mean? Well, when I think about which is better, lukewarm or cold, just even naturally, I'll choose cold, right? But let's talk about real life ministry in a local church. And I've been doing this for, you know, almost four decades. I know, I think, what Jesus is talking about. I would much rather work with someone who is cold towards the gospel than someone who is lukewarm towards it. I would rather someone be honest with me about their conclusions about Jesus Christ and the gospel than someone who's just getting all dressed up and playing churchianity. Can I have an amen in the room? No, you don't want to say amen because sometimes, don't, I, when I look in the mirror, I, sometimes Joe McConkie stands up before you or walks with you through this life, and I am plain churchianity. I'll admit that. And I think if you're half honest with yourself, you might come to the same conclusion in your own life. Huh? Okay, it could happen to your person next to you, but not to you. <laughs> and it makes me sick about myself when I'm not earnest about the things of God. Right? And so I, g- give me someone who's really struggling in their life with some, something that is resisting Jesus Christ. I would rather work with them than a believer who has a set of expectations put on God that simply are not biblical, and they're, they're whining because it's not working out the way that they want it to. And we, and we miss in the scriptures how God is using even the pain and the suffering to refine us. It's a, it's a metaphor even in the text we're looking at. He's, he's refining us. It means that we are going to go through fire and difficulty. We should expect it in the body of Christ. We don't sign up for it. We don't, we don't, we don't invite it, but we're going to get it. Okay? And so the symptom is you're neither cold nor hot. Verse 16 says, so because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Could, could we use a different English word? <laughs> no, this is what the Greek word means. You gag me. You upset my stomach, Jesus says, about this collection of believers. And it needs to leave us with that feeling of, oh my goodness, I've been, I've been duped. I've been deceived in my own experience. How could I be so blind when I thought I was rich and that I could see all things and, and that, that, man, I'm, I'm clothed with righteousness. That's what I thought about myself. But now you've shown up to our church in Laodicea this morning, Jesus, and you've read this letter to us, and, I'm dis- and we're disgusting to you. Feel the tension in this room right now, like, uh, uh, Joe, you're supposed to be a shepherd. <laughs> you're supposed to say kind things to us. All right, well, we're, we're going to get to those, but I want you to feel it. Because the intention of the author, the intention of the Holy Spirit is for the reader to feel the tension in the room that can happen in a person's life when they are blinded to the reality of their lukewarmness. 
Has anybody ever not been lukewarm in the room? Just raise your hand. Right? See, you know, either you're sleeping or you have a sore shoulder and you can't raise your hand. I don't know. (laughs) All of us know what the text is talking about. Sometimes I'm not zealous for God. Okay, your past, one of your pastors is, is admitting that to you. Sometimes I need a fire to be lit under me like this text does. I don't like it, frankly. My flesh hates it, but my spirit inside of me is saying, let's go, Joe. Let's go. Anybody with me on that? I need this. You need this. We have a tendency in our life to get lukewarm. So that's the symptom. The diagnosis, for uh, verse 17, for you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that, listen to this. <laughs> Can you imagine reading this in the, you know, if you're the, part of this church? You're wretched and you're pitiful, you're poor. What else? You're blind. Uh, what's the last thing? You're naked, right? It's like, okay, let's sing a hymn and go home. (laughs) What do you do with this in your life? What what, What does this church do? I mean, the symptoms are horrific and the diagnosis is pitiful. It's not my word. I'm, I'm not using hyperbole with you right now. This can happen in your life. This can happen collectively in a church family's life. We can, in the presence of God and, and at, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, under, under the microscope of Jesus Christ, we can actually be pitiful to Him. Wretched. You have permission. Right? This, this, is, this is what the text says. And, I got, and you and I need to wrestle with it this morning. Is anybody, like when you read this, and you, maybe, maybe you haven't been paying attention to the last six churches, which is fine. I understand. I'm a pastor. Do you remember I preached on that that one time? Uh-uh. Yeah. I worked really hard on that message. Sorry. <laughs> I get it. But, but we're here this morning together, okay? We're being real together this morning. And so I think this seventh church, the letter in the seventh church, maybe you're not tracking with me, maybe you are, represents probably the church in the industrialized world, the wealthy nations on the planet. We're the wealthiest of all nations on the planet. We have more than any other planet, than any other nation on, on, our, on the earth. In every standard across the, the planet, um, an American, even a poor American, is pretty wealthy. Wow. Just maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you individually and us collectively from this letter. And so, I I often wondered this week when I was reading this, what the other six churches, because all all seven of the churches read everybody's letter, (laughs) and we're reading everybody's letter. What were those other six churches thinking about the church at Laodicea? There's only one church that Jesus said nothing bad about. I don't, nothing against, and that was last week, Chad worked on Philadelphia. Nothing bad to say about them. The seventh one, he has nothing good to say. I think I've been a pastor long enough in in communities long enough to understand what it feels like to be a church that is part of the poor church in town. And everybody knows the wealthy church in town, huh? Maybe you haven't had that experience yet. I have as a pastor I think if the other six churches were to write a letter to the church at Laodicea, they would be going, you are awesome. Look at your building. Look at at how how much money you all make. 
Look at the beauty. Hmm. When I first moved to Winona, Minnesota, my neighbors, when they found out I was a pastor at Pleasant Valley, guess what they said? Oh, that's the rich Republican church. (laughs) Almost immediately, Laodicea came to my mind. Wow. The rich church. What are we rich in? Republican? I think the Lord, Lord weeps at that. The diagnosis is not good. Here's the remedy. You ready for some remedy this morning? It's not going to be any kinder for your flesh. Your spirit in you is going to say, Amen. But your flesh is going to be like, Oh, shoot. (laughs) All right, let's go. 18, I advise you. Here's Dr. Jesus in the church saying, Okay, we've gone through the symptoms, we've gone through the diagnosis. Y'all suck. You have a better word? I was on a missionary trip once. And, um, okay, just look at me and think about jump rope <laughs> for just a minute. It didn't, it didn't take you long, did it? And so, of course, the kids were playing soccer. And I played soccer. I got too tired, so I went with the jump ropers for a while. <laughs> and then I was 52 years old. And so they're jumping, I'm watching, I'm like, oh my goodness, these guys are really good at this, you know? So I say, hey, can I do that? And they hand me the end of the rope. I said, no, I want to jump. (laughs) They're all like, hey, let's call the whole village together, right? So I get in there and I get one, and then I, you know, it hits me, one, you know? And finally, one of the kids on one end of it, he was probably about a 12 year old guy. He didn't speak very much English, but he knew two words. No good. (laughs) For the tape, that's my wife laughing. (laughs) This church, at every turn, was no good. Would you be honest about your own life? What do you know the Spirit of God is saying to you that is no good? You have things. He's he's speaking to you. If you're investing any time just alone and quiet before Him, I know He's speaking to you. He's He's speaking great words of encouragement, but He's also bringing great conviction to you probably. And so the remedy, I advise you to buy from me. Why does he use buy? Because this church had it all. They could could buy anything. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. Implication? You have no idea how poor you are. You have everything that the world offers. You have nothing that matters. Does that speak to the American believer, church? And we know it, don't we? We have missionaries that will come and join us in our, in our churches, and, you know, they're, they're trying to be kind, but oftentimes if they're from a third world, they're like, oh, my goodness. You guys pray so little. You whine about stuff that really doesn't matter. When are you going to get it? Now, they're too kind to be that honest until you have a, supper, have a meal with them and say, okay, we're probably blind to some things in terms of the kingdom of God. Would you help us see? And I've heard those things from missionaries. And if you spent some time with missionaries, you probably have heard some similar things, that especially that come from third world countries. So I want you to buy for me refined gold. Now, I think that it's intentional on the part of Jesus to say, now, 
this gold I'm going to give you is, this is just a metaphor. I'm not talking about giving you really good bars of gold. I'm talking about you. I'm going to refine you. It's going to take suffering. And I want you to buy that from me, Jesus said. I want you to buy what you need from me. I want you to invite me in to have my way in your life in every room of your house. And he, he, he's right, isn't it? When, when, we, when we grow, I don't know if you're experiencing this. I, I'm hopefully you, you are, have, will. When you grow, it is going to require suffering. Is there a door too, Joe? <laughs> no. So the remedy is, um, I want you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be truly rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed in your shameful nakedness not be exposed. Why white clothes? Well, nakedness in the scriptures always means to be shameful before God, to be unrighteous before God, to be not clothed with Jesus Christ. I actually want to come and clothe you with my righteousness. I want, to, I want you to put off that old life, and I want you to put on this new life in me. Now, what's interesting, about, we know so much about Laodicea. Laodicea is a well-known uh, city in Turkey. Uh, back in the first century, Laodicea was the banking center of Turkey. It had the most wealth of any other city in that entire uh, region. We also know that it was a medical center. They had the most advanced medical, med and, and it was a training center for doctors. We also know that it was a textile capital in the modern first world. They had wool uh, that was particularly uh, suited to make the best clothes around the planet at that point. This was a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy city. In 60 AD, we know about Laodicea, that it had a major earthquake. And every other town in that first century that had an earthquake would have to depend on Rome to rebuild it, not Laodicea. They had all that they need. They rebuilt it on their own. We have need of nothing was the slogan of the city, and it became the slogan of the church. It became the slogan of the individual believer. We got it. And Jesus says, you are poor pitifully poor. You're wretched. You're not righteous. You're naked and you're blind. And, and so Jesus is speaking to the culture in Laodicea. Do you see it? And I want, I want you to buy from me ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. You're blind. You have no idea how wretched and pitiful you are before me. You need to see this, y'all. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Remember, this is the disgusting church that Jesus did not despise, but loved. Aren't you grateful for that in your own life? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. This is what someone that loves somebody else does. I don't, I, I love you too much to stay where you're at in your squalor. I love you too much to stay where you're at in that addiction, in that thing that's ru ruining your life, right? This is what we do to the people, with the people that we love around us. I rebuke and I discipline. And so he says this, and this is in contrast to being lukewarm. This is a remedy. You got to become zealous. And IV uses, I think, the word earnest. Uh, the, most, the, the majority of time this word is translated in our New Testament. It's the word, we use the word jealous, actually. It's an interesting concept. Do not provoke one another to jealousy. It's the same word. 
It, it means to be passionately desirable. Be zealous. And I have been asking myself this. Well, come back with me. I know it's getting, Joe's got a lot of words up here. So come, come back with me for just a minute, okay? How, do, how does a person like, like I can't look, I, I'm like thinking about as a parent, how can I look at my, you know, and I don't have a 16-year-old, how could I look at my 16-year-old back in the day and say, you need to become zealous and earnest about this? Uh, how does a person become zealous? Well, it depends on who's saying that to them. The amen is saying this to you. The faithful, the faithful and true witness is saying this to you. The originator of God's creation is saying, I think it matters. How does a person become zealous? It depends on who's saying it. <laughs> and your creator, your savior, your redeemer is saying to you, you need to become zealous for me. I'm zealous for you. Look at the next verse. We're in the remedy. See, I stand at the door and I knock on your door. I want you to let me in so that we can have a meal together, so that we can have deep fellowship together. Look, you do not have to go knocking on Jesus' door. He's knocking on your door. Come on. You're disgusting. It doesn't matter to him. He's knocking on your door. I just want a relationship with you. You don't have to go searching for this originator and creator of all that God has made. You don't have to go look for the amen. You don't have to go and hunt for the faithful and true witness. He is coming towards you. Does this amaze anybody in the room? And I want to eat with you in the first century. That means I want to have a deep friendship with you. Wow. This is the remedy. Be zealous and repent. Let me in. Church, you have kept me on the outside. You're the church that I never have been inside of. Let me come in. And then this hopeful prognosis to the one who conquers. It's an interesting word. It's a word Nike. We get the word Nike from. Nicola is the, the verb here. The one who conquers. If all the other six churches are looking at the church at Laodicea, they're saying they are the conquerors. Jesus says, you're the losers. You're not the winners. You're not victorious. You're everything, but on the outside, you look great. On the inside, it's not real. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit on my throne. If you are leading worship with us here at the end of the service, come on up and be with me on the platform, please. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. What? The disgusting one? You are saying and promising Jesus that you will, if they conquer, you are going to let the disgusting one sit on the throne with you? That's what the text says. That's not fair, the rest of us say, right? But it's true. And the thing is, are you willing to conquer that thing that is in between you and Jesus Christ? Are you willing to say no to Joe, you fill in your own name, and say yes to Jesus in that area or those areas that you know are hindering you from enjoying all that Jesus Christ died and purchased for you? Are you willing to do that? To the one who conquers. So now we're, we're, we're back to, in this particular text, the human will. We're grateful for the sovereignty of God and the move of God and all of that. But what more can Jesus Christ do? He's knocking at your door even though you're disgusting, church at Laodicea. What more can he do? You have the choice to open the door. And, and by the way, evangelists have used this passage. It's an okay, 
you know, passage to use to invite someone into a relationship with Christ. These are believers that Jesus is talking to in Laodicea. <laughs> this is you and me he's talking to. And maybe you have pushed him out the door. Or maybe you just have, you're getting all dressed up and playing Christianity. It's not real. So I think this, we're going to transition right into the table, into the dining room. Jesus just wants to sit down and eat with you. And he's bringing everything. What you do is you just bring yourself. Just to have your way in me, Jesus. So when we, when we pass out that little piece of bread and that cup, it represents Jesus Christ giving to you everything that you need for life and godliness and eternity. And so if you, if you guys are serving, um, why don't you come on, the people that are serving, come on up. I'm going to continue to talk here for a moment. This is Jesus. And, you know, that tray comes by. I want you to hear the door knocking. I want you to take that, take two cups, or they're stacked on one another. Make sure you take both of those. This is Jesus saying, hey, I'm at the door. I want a relationship with you. I care deeply about you. I know your works. This is a beautiful thing about Jesus. He knows everything about us, yet he still comes towards us. Anybody? Does that... Stay with me, even though you're, you're looking at people passing stuff out. Stay with me for a minute. Anybody? Like, that's amazing to me. He knows everything about, he knows my works. He knows my tendency. He knows my motives. Yet he says, I just want a relationship with you, Joe. Right, right in the midst of that disgustingness, I want a relationship with you. I want you to conquer, Joe. I want you to sit with me for eternity on the throne over all sorts of things. But will you choose to conquer those things that are in between you and me? Do it with my power. Do it with my love. But are you willing to become a conqueror? That's the question of the text. Whoever is willing to conquer, I will let them sit at the right hand of me on my throne, just as I, see the rest of that verse 21, just as I have conquered, I have won. What was his conquering? It was on a cross. He died to himself for us, rose for us, paid for us. And that is a pattern then for you as a follower of Jesus Christ. I get to die on behalf of some, for somebody else. I, got to, I get to live my life the way that Jesus lived his life, not for my ends, but for his ends. I want you to conquer, Jesus says, like I have. So if you haven't, separate those. Woo, this is going to spill all over my Joe's shirt up here. Okay, let's go for cup number two. If you know what I'm talking about, there we go. The little piece of bread. This is Jesus sitting down at the table with you, for you, and saying, I love you so much, I gave my body on a Roman cross as a payment for your sin. I, I did this for you. So I want you to take this, eat it in remembrance of him. That'd be enough if someone just died for me, gave his body for me, but it didn't stop there. He said, I also very specifically shed my blood to cover all of your sins, past, present, and future. Just come to me. Trust me. 
I love you. I'm, I'm making a covenant. I'm making a promise to you in this cup. So maybe you've been away from him. Maybe this is a time as you drink this cup, you're just you're saying, I, I'm coming back to you, Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Let's take and drink in remembrance of him. Thank you, Jesus, for um, just some time to remember you. And as we sing this song, God, I pray that it would be a song of declaration from our heart. Uh, it would be a, a testimony, an opportunity, Father, for you just to do some more work in us. In the name of Jesus, let's stand, if you'd like, and worship.
you didn't have a chance, pick up one of these cards on your way out, kind of what's happening at PV. Of course, you can go on the website and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we got Camp Awesome coming up. Read about that. We've got Stepping Up, some kids moving on, and we've got a women's book club that's coming up. Just want you to highlight those things. Hey, finances at Pleasant Valley are in need of uh, you to go back to the Lord and say, hey, how can, can I help? Um, when we are, when it says 4% behind, that represents about $40,000. So um, that might help you a little bit understand, uh, at least from our side of it. Um, the urgency of us taking good care of um, our staff. We have 30 missionary uh, people and entities that we also take care of that are counting on us. We have 17, not all full-time staff here at Pleasant Valley. Uh, so we have a lot, right? We do. Um, but I just need to let you know, uh, we need you to go back to the Lord and say, hey, how can, how can I help uh, Pleasant Valley, um, particularly right now? Okay, you willing to do that? I will say the whole thing over. <laughs> Starting from the beginning. Yeah. Lord, thank you for one another. Thank you that we got to be together like this today. Uh, we love you so much. Have your way in our life. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you all.